Welcome to the Retirement Made Easy podcast. I'm your host, Greg Gonzalez. My goal for the podcast is to help you live a better life in retirement by giving you the tools and information you need in a language that you can understand. On today's episode, this comes from a listener request where a listener wrote me an email asking what questions should she ask a potential financial advisor that she was considering hiring to help her with her retirement planning, such as social security, pension planning, investments, and all the rest. And so I came up with a list of five questions that I would recommend or I would suggest that you ask a financial advisor before you hire them. We'll go over those five things that you should ask your potential financial advisor on today's podcast. Before we get into the meat and potatoes, I wanted to remind everybody to visit our website, which is retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. That's retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. While you're there, you can listen to past episodes. You can also check out our retirement secret sauce, as well as our 2020 tax guide. You can download those right there on the website. Again, retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. Let's get into today's content, shall we? So this question, this listener question was from Beth, and Beth wanted to know what five questions should she bring with her to her appointment with her potential next financial advisor? She was on the verge of retirement, and this was an important decision to her, and she wanted to make sure she was hiring the right person. So I put a lot of time into this, and as a financial advisor, I've been asked a ton of questions. There's a ton of good questions to ask a potential retirement planner. The first one you want to ask, in my opinion, is how long have you been doing this? Tell me about your experience. Tell me about your credentials that you might have. What I would recommend is if you're on the doorstep of retirement, let's say you're 62 years old and you're going to hire a financial advisor to help you navigate retirement, that's fantastic. But I would encourage you not to hire someone who's 65 or 70 or, heaven forbid, 75 years old. And I know it may be obvious, but if you're going to hire a 65-year-old financial advisor, they're going to want to retire at some point too. And I have seen so many people hire older advisors and not even think, oh gosh, we're going to be searching for a replacement here in the next couple of years when this financial advisor wants to have their own retirement. So experience is important. I would look for at least 10 years of experience if you can, but you don't want somebody with 45 years of experience because they might be on the doorstep of retirement too. So that's important. Also, you want to look at their credentials, certain credentials, such as a certified financial planner. That is kind of the gold standard, in my opinion, when it comes to financial advisors. So that's important. If they have a CFP behind their name, that's a plus. If they have a CPA, certified public accountant, there's no doubt that would be beneficial. Are they a chartered financial consultant? That's another popular designation that financial advisors have. So ask them, again, what is your experience working with people like me? And that may be how many years have you been doing this? That kind of thing. And then also what credentials do you have that help you to serve those clients, that make you a specialist in serving those clients? And again, I pointed out a few. There's also called an AIF. It's an accredited investment fiduciary. That is becoming popular as well. But I I gave you a certified financial planner, chartered financial consultant, CPA, which is a certified public accountant, and then the accredited investment fiduciary. Those are probably four of the most popular that you will see. So question number two that you'll want to ask a potential financial advisor is, do you have a specialty? What is your specialty? And hopefully they're going to say retirement planning or whatever you're looking for. There are some financial advisors that really specialize in insurance planning. So like home and auto, life insurance planning, disability insurance planning. That's probably not the person that 
is best suited to help you with retirement planning. Just think of attorneys. Attorneys, there's personal injury attorneys, there's defense attorneys, there's estate planning attorneys, there's criminal law or traffic ticket attorneys. So they all have their own specialty. It's the same with financial advisors or doctors for that matter. Doctors have their own specialty. You have your general practitioner. You also have a neurologist, for example. That's a very specified area of practice. Another example, there's financial advisors out there that specialize in working with retired government workers, for example. That's a very specialized area, and their clients are all of the same shape and mold, so to speak. So that would be a benefit to someone that's a retiring government worker. There's also financial advisors out there that specialize in employer plans, such as like 401ks or 403bs. That advisor might not be the best person for you if you are an individual, but they might be an excellent choice if you're setting up a 401k with a small or medium-sized business, and many business owners are attracted to those people because they have such a vast experience in employer plans, and they really understand the ins and outs of those employer plans. So specialty to me is very important And many financial advisors or most financial advisors will have their own specialty or area of expertise, so to speak. The next question, which is question number three, I would certainly ask, and really I should have probably asked this as question number one or two on the importance scale, but I would certainly ask, are you a fiduciary? And let them answer. There are some financial advisors out there that are fiduciaries, which means by law, they have to act in their client's best interest and put their client's best interest ahead of their own at all times. That's what a fiduciary is. There are other advisors that are not fiduciaries. It's a very important distinction that you need to make sure that your advisor, in my opinion, is a fiduciary. That doesn't mean that the people who aren't fiduciaries are bad people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, in my opinion, I would prefer to work with a financial advisor who is a fiduciary. That's just my opinion. I want to know that this person has to act in my best interest at all times and has to put my best interest ahead of their own at all times. The next question, question number four, that I think that you should ask a financial advisor. And I am surprised because when I meet with couples, when I meet with folks that are currently working with a financial advisor, I always ask them if they know how they are compensating their current financial advisor. And I would say the vast majority, probably three quarters of the people that I ask that question to, they all say, no, I have no idea how we're compensating our financial advisor. And that just disturbs me. It really even shocks me that you could be paying fees and commissions and you don't know what they are. So it is a perfectly logical first question or first of the five questions, so to speak, is to ask the person, how do you get paid? If we are going to have this engagement together, this working relationship, how are you compensated? And hopefully they're very straightforward with their compensation, whatever it may be. And I thought I would take a minute to arm you with the ways that financial advisors can be compensated. And I'm going to reserve my opinion on which method or methods I personally prefer. I just simply want to explain the different ways in which a financial advisor is compensated. So you know up front of what to expect. The first way a financial advisor can be compensated is fairly simple. It's a commissioned-based structure. So if a financial advisor recommends certain investment products, he or she would earn a commission when you buy or sell the different investments. It's sort of like a real estate agent. When you buy or sell your house and you use a real estate agent, they're going to make a commission. 
you might hear someone say that their real estate agent charges 6% commission. 3% of that goes to the buying agent and 3% of that goes to the selling agent. It's somewhat similar for a financial advisor. Again, the commission is earned on the transaction itself. It may be a 2% commission. It may be a 5% commission. Whatever it may be, that's how the financial advisor is compensated. And I'm okay with that as long as it's disclosed. That needs to be disclosed to you up front that the advisor earns his or her compensation through a commission basis. The next way a financial advisor may be compensated is an hourly fee arrangement or some type of engagement like that. It's very similar to an attorney. An attorney may bill by the hour. So an attorney may bill $100 an hour, let's say, or $200 an hour. I had a client that his CPA, his accountant, will actually bill by the hour. So if he calls his accountant, has a 30-minute discussion with him, he'll get a bill in the mail, an invoice, billing him for his time. Financial advisors will often do that too. So they will bill by the hour of whatever the engagement was. Maybe they were putting together a retirement plan or an analysis of a portfolio. They may charge by the hour to do that. As long as you know what you're getting, what you're paying for, you're going to be in good shape. And the last most common way in which financial advisors get paid is through an advisory fee. So you might hear people say, oh, I pay a 1% advisory fee to my financial advisor. And so the advisory fee comes directly out of your portfolio and you don't have to pay it out of pocket, so to speak. The 1% advisory fee would be deducted from your portfolio, from your investment account. That's another popular way that advisors are compensated. And it's a great way for you to track it because on your statements, that advisory fee will be disclosed. So you can check your quarterly or maybe your annual statement and you can see what you have paid so far in an advisory fee so far this year or for the entire year if it's your annual statement. And advisors shouldn't be ashamed with how they're compensated, it's kind of the cost of doing business. You have to look at, okay, for the good that they're bringing to my life, for the value that they're bringing to my life and all the work that they're doing, are they worth what I'm paying them? Whether it be a fee or a commission, do I think I'm getting a good value for the dollars that I'm spending? That's really what it boils down to. And if you are, you're gonna love the relationship. And if you feel that you're not getting the value, well, you might look elsewhere. And last but not least, question number five that I would ask a potential financial advisor that I was looking to hire. I would ask them if they could describe the process of working together. And probably what I'm hoping that they'll discuss is how often they communicate with their clients. There was a study years ago that was done that looked at the number one reason why people were dissatisfied with their financial advisor and it ended up leaving their financial advisor. And what surprised me is it wasn't performance. The number one reason someone left their financial advisor because they were dissatisfied was because they were unhappy with the communication from their financial advisor. Maybe the advisor didn't have a system in place for semi-annual review meetings or annual review meetings. And that's why the people ended up leaving their financial advisor was because the communication just wasn't up to par. So you want to know ahead of time what you're getting into. What are they delivering as far as keeping you updated on your financial plan? You want to know that you're not going to be forgotten and you're not going to be just another number to this financial advisor. You want to make sure that you will get to meet with them periodically. Maybe it's over the phone. Maybe it's a Zoom call. Maybe it's a meeting in their office. But you want to review your progress with them because there's going to be changes in your life that occur. And maybe there's going to be some adjustments that need to be made. So I would want to know how often are you going to communicate with me if I were to become a client? 
And hopefully they're going to tell you they do annual or semi-annual review meetings. Maybe it's quarterly calls that they reach out to people to check in on them, review any changes in their lives, things like that. You don't want to hear someone say, yeah, we review things every four or five years. That's just not going to cut it. And I don't think you're going to get a very good value if you're reviewing your retirement plan with your advisor every four or five years. Believe me, that's a warning sign right there. So those are the top five questions that I would certainly ask a potential financial advisor that I was looking to hire. Another question, it didn't quite make the top five, but it might make a question number six. I've been asked this a lot, and I know why people are asking it. They ask, how many clients do you have? And I think why they're asking this is because they don't want to become just another number. If the financial advisor says, for example, that they work with 950 families, that's kind of a red flag. If you're one out of 950 clients, you're probably going to get lost in the shuffle, or you might get lost in the shuffle and just become another number. Versus if that same advisor only had 95 clients, you can bet that the service you would receive from that financial advisor would be a lot better simply because he or she is working with fewer families, fewer clients. Let's face it, we've only got so much time in the day. And if a financial advisor has 950 families that he or she is servicing, you have to think you are one out of 950 clients. So you may not receive the personalized service that you might be looking for. You may, but chances are you might receive better service or more personalized service from an advisor who has less clients. That's just my opinion. But again, I have had a lot of people ask me that personally as a financial advisor, how many clients do you work with? And my goal is to work with 125 families and then kind of cap it off at that point, just because I know there's only so much time in the day and I want to provide the best service to all families that I work for. I don't want to provide good service to some and not to all. So realizing that there's only so many people that you can service. I think personally what people want is they're looking for a financial advisor who cares a financial advisor who's going to take the time to understand them and be there for them as their financial advocate through thick and thin. And when you have 950 families to worry about as a financial advisor, that is very difficult to do. So question number six, you might ask, and this wasn't in the original five, but you might ask your potential financial advisor, how many clients are you currently working with? And if you hear a number like 950, and they're expecting you to be impressed, I wouldn't be impressed personally. That's way too many clients to provide good service to. A funny story thinking about this, I had a client who I've been working with for a few years now, and I asked him about the relationship with their former advisor. And this former advisor was very, very successful, had a great reputation, and had a huge, huge business. And I asked this client, what did you like about his business, his service, what did you not like about it? And the first thing that the husband and this couple said was, every time I went in there, he called me by the wrong name. And me and my wife made a joke about it for years and years, but every single meeting, he called me by the wrong name. And over the years, it just showed me his lack of attention to detail and how much he just didn't care about our success if he didn't take the time to learn my name and get it correct. I guess it drove him crazy over the years. And more or less, it's a sign that someone just doesn't care enough to get your name correct, of all things. So I hope those questions today helps you. For those of you that are looking to hire a retirement planner, a financial advisor, to kind of navigate your path, your journey through retirement, Some of you I know do your own planning, and that's perfectly fine. But for those of you that are searching for that financial advocate, that financial planner that is going to act as your guide to get you to and through retirement, those are five questions that I would ask, definitely ask a potential financial advisor. 
and I even gave six, how many clients are you working with? That might be important to know as well to give you an idea of what kind of service you might expect from that person. So this episode has been great. I appreciate you tuning in this week. Again, I want to remind listeners, check out my website, which is retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. That's retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. There you can download my free retirement secret sauce, as well as our 2020 tax planning guide. So check that out, retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. And we'll be back next week with another episode of the Retirement Made Easy podcast. Until next time, remember, always dream big. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, please consult your attorney, financial advisor, or tax advisor prior to investing. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, member of FINRA, SIPC.